Well, good evening and welcome to the uh, UCL Institute for Environment and Design Engineering. I'm Mike Davis, Director of the Institute, um, and uh, many thanks for coming along. We're very fortunate this evening to have uh, Professor Paul Wilkinson here from the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And uh, I've had the pleasure of working with Paul now for, well, for many years. And uh, I think the collaboration between SHM and UCL has been uh, both incredibly exciting but also very, very productive. And I think that the, uh, hopefully the way that we work together, if the groups work together in a, in a very interdisciplinary way, has been, uh, it's been very fruitful. And so I hope there's uh, much more of that to, to come. Uh, Paul's going to talk to us uh, this evening about how to build a, a healthy house. And uh, following his talk will be, uh, which is going to be around 40 minutes, I think. There'll be an opportunity for questions and uh, discussion for a further 20 minutes or so, and then I hope you'll uh, join us for some uh, drinks where we can continue the discussions, and those drinks will be on the uh, first the first floor. So uh, uh, thanks again for coming along, and uh, I'll hand you over to Paul. We had one or two problems with the projector, so uh, it's not Paul's fault that the uh, resolution is uh, poor, it's, uh, it's, our, it's our fault. Uh, and also Paul will have to dart backwards and forwards to the uh, uh, computer. But anyway. I'll hand over to you, Paul. Right. Thank you very much. Well, I'm, uh, thank you for inviting me to speak. Um, I wasn't quite sure exactly what would be of interest to you. And what I've actually put together is sort of really just a little bit of musing, uh, my own musing about what is it we should be trying to investigate and to measure with regard to a healthy home. Because uh, we tend to do certain sorts of things, uh, but ignore other categories. And so I'm going to try and run through what I think is the, um, the kind of agenda for where we should be headed. Um, now, uh, I've always I've heard several times that the easiest thing for an audience like this is to tell them what the message is to begin with so you can then leave whenever you like. This is what I'm going to say. And the first is that what we generally do in research is generally good to quantify <coughs> health risks associated with the indoor environment, by which I mean things like mold, uh, indoor air quality, temperature. Um, so there are plenty of uncertainties to do with that. Um, <coughs> however, there is too great an emphasis on the minimization of hazards at the expense of those things which I think reflect uh, aspects of hazard that kind of promote good health. And we need some new methods to measure the widest sweep of health parameters that are influenced by housing, um, and there is a need for a program of research. So that's all it is. That's the, that's the, uh, that's the, the message. So I'm going to start simply, and the first question is, what is a house? Um, because <coughs> it's an obvious question in many ways. They take many different forms, architecture, etc. But it's not so much what is a house, but what is a house for? And uh, we wrote this definition some, uh, in a paper we wrote a few years ago, which kind of summarizes, I think, all the aspects that I'm interested in. A healthy home, so it's not just a home, but a healthy one needs to have sound structure, i.e. to provide shelter against the elements, to be free of hazards, to provide adequate facilities for sleeping, personal hygiene, preparation and storage of food, an environment for comfortable relaxation, for privacy and tranquility, and facilities for social exchange with friends, family and others. And that's quite a big thing really, it's not just about whether you've got radon in the home, it's also about how you, how you uh, talk to friends. Now, well, how do we define its characteristics? Well, I've already made the point that essentially the way most of us traditionally have focused on this, not all people, I mean, there are many groups that study other angles, but um, we tend to focus a lot on the hazards rather than health. We focus on protection rather than health promotion. We focus more on the hard rather than the soft, so things which we can easily count rather than the rather more loosely defined soft outcomes. And we are concerned very much with the indoor without so much considering what's outside the home. Um, and all of those things are kind of uh, important to me. Now, uh, I'm not sure if you can see these very well. Here are two sets of, uh, of dwellings. Um, the first one is our, uh, our Bro in the Cotswolds, uh, very ancient, uh, very uh, picturesque sort of houses. This is a new development in Neverstow in Somerset, I think. Um, and it just seemed to me, it's kind of curious to think about it, that if you did an assessment of what the health hazards associated with our often would be, the ones on the left would be a health hazard. Because it's ancient, it's almost certainly cold, uh, it's probably not up to standard with regard to uh, damp and all those things, and yet the, the price of the ones on the left are probably several times the price of the houses on the right. 
And all the ones over here are the ones which we think are, they meet all, all the bill, uh, they kind of, they are more energy efficient, they got they passed all the energy standards, modern bills, and so the rest of it. Um, this one also has, by the way, just in the background, if you can just see the circle, you probably can't see the circle here, but in there, that's um, Hinkley Point Power Station, just nearby. So there's a lot of nice nuclear background to their, to their houses. Um, and uh, I took, stole this from a colleague of mine who's done some research uh, thinking about energy efficiency, what motivates people um, to make changes uh, uh, with regard to the fact that energy efficiency is something which we kind of portray as this is an important parameter for us to improve in dwellings uh, because you know, it's good for the environment and the rest of it. But how much does it really feature in their list of priorities? And the basic issue is it doesn't. Um, so, I don't know if you can read this very easily, but it's kind of, um, as you go up, that's kind of the more they're likely to, to pay attention to it. And at the top, the things which really drive their desire is, does it make any difference to comfort and convenience or function within the home? Um, and then the next thing, the next question they ask is, will, will it save you money? How much will it cost? Uh, will it improve the quality of the building, i.e. it's an investment? Quite a long way down the list is, anything to do with climate change, the environment, sustainability, any of the objectives that, that kind of the wider uh, audience pr project as the important reason for trying to carry out some of these interventions. <coughs> um, and so I put on this list here the, the two, two sets of things. What do we hear when we try and buy a house? And what regulators and researchers tend to do when they are thinking about the risk we need to protect against or to ensure? So if we look at the right hand list first of all, that's largely to do with safety, it's to do with exposure to hazards inside the home, and of course these days there are larger uh, objectives in regard to energy efficiency, and there are also questions of legality, and that often depends on how your dwelling affects neighbours. Um, so it's really a, a variant of the legal position. So that's what we focus on. If you say, well, what, are you, what is it that determines whether you buy a home, almost nobody walks in and says, I wonder what the radon levels are here. I wonder how good the, air, the ventilation parameters are, etc. What they say is, well, firstly, how much does it cost? Then they say, well, what's the space? <coughs> I'm interested in the space we live in, what it means I can do. Uh, then they like to look at the, the light. Is it a nice airy room or not? Very persuasive. What outlook? Is there a view? And that makes a big difference to the price of the property, if you have a good view. What's a character? Is it a nice old characterful Georgian mansion or is it, you know, one of these uh, new build uh, characterless uh, flats? Is it function? Does what facilities it have? What's its location? Is there any nuisance here? Are there things around about or neighbours which are likely to cause a problem? Is there a sense of community? There is not much connection between the left hand list and the right hand list. There's some, but it's uh, much weaker than I think it should be. So what I'm going to do in this uh, talk is go through four aspects, I think, of, about the houses we live in to consider how we begin to understand their relevance to health and ask some questions about how we should be trying to proceed to quantify some of those uh, relationships with health and perhaps take a, a broad look at all the different um, things we should be worrying about. So the first is actually traditional territory, and this is, and I'm going to use quite a few examples of things which we, that uh, Mike and his group here, many of you sitting in the audience I know, we've been doing over the last few years, trying to quantify the indoor environment, particularly with regard to um, uh, uh, air quality and temperature. Um, how we measure that, um, because actually, although it seems very straightforward, it actually entails very unconventional epidemiology to be able to, uh, to answer the question. But then we're going to focus on three other questions. The first one is space, how we should, what we should worry about, or should we think about it, and how important it is. The second is to think about some of these less tangible things, light, outlook, noise. And then lastly, the location, the local environment as uh, an important parameter of the housing we live in. So, the first is the indoor physico-chemical environment. Well, a lot of that's driven by questions with, with the energy efficiency, and here's a diagram I've used many times over many years of some of the connections, it's by no means comprehensive, of the connection between energy efficiency and what is inside your home. So broadly it boils down into three sections. Those coloured purple are to do with ventilation characteristics. 
if you make a home more energy efficient or build to be energy efficient, you tend to cons constrain the ventilation characteristics, which means it affects indoor air quality and has a bearing on mold growth. Now, sometimes those are positive, protects against the ingress of air from pollution from outside. Uh, if, it, if it increases warmth, it can uh, help reduce mold growth, but it can also do the reverse, depending on the balance of, of temperature and ventilation. The second set are those things which are largely to do with temperature. I've put increased temperature because the main focus for us in the UK has been winter cold rather than summer heat. Um, and indeed, if you're in any doubt of, that, of this, a colleague of mine published in the Lancet only a few months ago a global analysis of temperature-related impacts and demonstrated very eloquently that in all countries, almost without exception around the globe, the burden of cold-related mortality is much higher than that due to heat. We focus entirely on heat and worrying about climate change, but actually we've been ignoring cold burdens, uh, correspondingly ignoring them for many years. They are much larger, by a factor almost of an uh, order of magnitude. Uh, so in the UK we have about <coughs> 2,000 heat deaths a year, but we have about 20,000 cold deaths. Um, so we look at the indoor temperature, and how that uh, affects things. And there are direct routes between temperature and uh, winter mortality, morbidity, thermal comfort, and psychosocial well-being. But there's also a route that goes through our use of space. And in fact, some of the early work that colleagues of mine did in a, um, in a study we undertook a decade ago, I suppose, was that if you ask people what if they have an upgrade to their home that makes it warmer, more energy efficient and warmer, what do they notice? And the thing that they most notice is that they can now use more of their home more often. Uh, it's because rooms are heated better, they've got a greater sense of freedom and space, and during the middle of winter, not, not everyone's huddled around the fire trying to get warm, they can use the, the home in its full extent. And then there is the route down here, which has kind of actually two parts to it, which is lower fuel use, which has a cost implication, increases for those on low income in particular, disposable income, which means they can then afford to buy more things. So there is a question of how important this route is, and frankly we don't know very much well how important this route is. We have some limited indirect evidence, but there is certainly a route, and of course it has bearing on the emissions to the wider environment, local pollution and uh, uh, greenhouse gases, the global environment too. So here is a network of connections uh, to health, but they're not, it's not comprehensive as I said, and not all of them are ones which we can easily quantify. These psychosocial routes that you have down here, and some of these things like the way people use income and how that helps health, still remain difficult for us to quantify. And um, even, with ta even with questions which you th may think are very simple, uh, it gets very hard, in fact, epidemiologically, to pin down what, uh, exactly what the relationship is. Um, so our task epidemiologically is to quantify the burden illness attributable to features of the dwelling. That's not just to say, is one house different from another, or how health statistics. We must be able to make an attribution and say, this is because of the difference in the dwelling. And uh, as I'll explain now, that gives rise to a number of challenges, a number of problems, I should say, really. The first one is confounding. Um, and confounding, if you aren't familiar with this, kind of, I mean this in the epidemiological sense, which means you're not quite sure what's causing the driving the patterns, but maybe something else other than the exposure of interest. Um, and this is important in particular because uh, in, if you're comparing people living in one dwelling with another, the bigger, better built houses tend to correlate with wealth. And with wealth comes all sorts of other things too. So it's not fair if you just if you just compare a, a poorly maintained uh, house with one which is much better maintained and often which is different size. Clearly, there you have to allow for the fact that you are dealing with people who are very largely different in their socioeconomic position, and that's quite a problem. The second is a numbers game. Now, epidemiologists count uh, deaths, events, people going to hospital, and actually. Unfortunately for epidemiologists, but fortunately for everybody else, <coughs> the events are rare. On average, it's, uh, the number of people, the proportion of people who die, is about 1% a year. So even if you study a thousand homes, a thousand people uh, living in, I don't know, four or five hundred homes, 
the probability is that only about 10 of those will die over a period of analysis, over a period of observation, which is barely enough to tell anything. So you can see that there is a, a scale problem here, is that we need large numbers um, to, be able to, to be able to count sufficient numbers of deaths to understand relationships. But it is particularly difficult when you're studying housing because the question isn't just, well, how many people died? It's the question, do more people die in this setting than in another one? And often, is, it, is the relationship between mortality and some exposure different in different dwellings? I'll give an example of this in a minute that uh, the colleagues here at the UCL have helped to develop on to do with heat risk. Um, but it's all about looking at differences in association. And because you're studying differences in patterns, you tend not just to need thousands of dwellings, you need millions of dwellings, which gives a whole different strategy about how you can begin to uh, analyze and study those problems. Um, the next is therefore about data linkage, because we have plenty of health statistics, but how do you attribute those, or how do you link them to dwellings? Because it's not always easy. We are fortunate in the UK to have postcoding, at a very fine level, so our UK postcode on average relates to about 14 households. It's quite small, but it's not a perfect one-to-one -one match. Occasionally, there are mechanisms, increasingly people are trying these days to do linkages at one-to-one -one level, i.e. you can work out exactly which dwelling people live in. But there are all sorts of ethical barriers to that, and that is rarely possible uh, in, in any other country in the world, with the exception of some of the Scandinavian countries can do that one-to-one uh, -one linkage. Um, but we need, because of this linkage, we need to generate, not only to be able to link health data, but we need to do so uh, for all dwellings and be able to classify all dwellings. So even if you can do the linkage, if you don't know how to characterize any one dwelling, because you don't know its characteristic very well, you haven't really gained very much. So again, there's a process of having to understand how you can characterize dwellings. And the fourth difficulty is one of the outcomes that we really would like to study are often soft. You know, if somebody dies, that's usually unequivocal. If somebody gets miserable, that's very hard to determine. And uh, we basically don't, carry, uh, don't collect any stats which are relevant to that. Um, there are occasional surveys, but they're <coughs> actually just a few thousand people. Um, there aren't things which we can easily get hold of from routine data. So all these problems mean it's quite difficult even to make the attribution of how do you link housing to a certain characteristic. So here's the here's an example of um, what I think actually uh, is that quite an innovative way of trying to piece together the puzzle. Um, uh, I'm not sure whether any any one individual working in one of these steps really considers the whole thing and thinks, oh yeah, that's quite impressive. To me, this is quite impressive because the challenge here was to answer this question. That is, if you live in a house which is more likely to overheat during the summer period, do you have a higher risk of dying from heat? You know, is there a greater heat risk to that individual? What does that entail? Well, first of all, we have to work out how much any one dwelling is likely to heat up during a period of hot weather. And so the clever guys here at UCL, the building physicists and so on, they carry out some simulations. They say, well, we know what different housing types look like. Let's run some simulations to see if we can determine the type, the characteristics, the properties of dwellings that determine whether it's going to get hot during hot weather or whether it actually will stay relatively cool because it's, the temperature is buffered by the thermal mass and by its, uh, its uh, conductance properties and so on. Having done that, you then have to determine a marker of whether it overheats or not. And so uh, I've written this, listed there as a determination of the anomaly. That is, you would then have to classify all dwellings saying, this is one that overheats more than this one. So you can classify every dwelling in the country, or a very high proportion of them, <coughs> according to their overheating risk. You then have to do that classification. You have to say, all right, we've done it in theory, we've done the simulation, we know which dwellings tend to overheat, now let me make that attribution to every dwelling in the country. So you go through, you use some data and say, well, this dwelling is of this age, of this type, we know these are the ones that are likely to overheat more. <coughs> and so that requires having geographically complete data, or something close to it, and be able to make that attribution to all of those areas across the country. Then, you can link the health data to it. We have postcodes, sometimes may even have addresses, 
and you can say, all right, let's link those addresses to all those dwellings, and I'm now going to study the, the mortality patterns across the whole country. But not just mortality, mortality in relation to the outdoor temperature. So you kind of have to say, well, how do the patterns of mortality against outdoor temperature vary according to the dwelling in which you live? So in case you haven't seen it before or don't, don't, aren't aware of it, there is a very clear relationship between temperature and your risk of dying. And it's very, very well understood. So well that, in fact, if you tell me what the temperature will be tomorrow, I can tell you how many people will die in London to a very high precision. It's a very well characterized relationship, and here it is. This is the one for London. Um, if you can just about read it, this is the uh, uh, maximum daytime temperature. And here is the curve uh, with a constant around it. And so up to that point, there is no increase in, temp no increase in mortality as the temperature rises. But above that point, you can see that the curve lifts off. And it's actually almost quadratic, going up here. And so as the temperature gets hotter and hotter, if it goes up to 35, you're starting to get a substantial increase in risk. This is the kind of annual average or the baseline level of risk. And here it is rising up uh, as it gets hotter and hotter. And it's a very well-defined function. So the question we asked was, OK, if that is the general function, does it vary? And you'll note that although it's actually a curve, um, we tend often to split this into saying, well, let's pretend, because it's easier to deal with, it's a, a straight line. So there's a flat bit where there's no effect. And then at this threshold point, there is a, a linear increase with heat. There's a straight line graph. It's easier to deal with straight line graph because it's got one slope. And the question we then have to ask, oops, yes, is, is this. If that's the overall relationship, there's the threshold, there's the slope between actual temperature and the risk of dying. Does that get steeper if you live in a dwelling that's more likely to overheat? You've defined by doing the simulation and attributing those characteristics to houses. And does it get flatter if you live in a dwelling which is less likely to overheat, which is buffered against heat? Um, and that's the essential process to it. It's kind of easy in principle, but behind it is a huge amount of, uh, of, of uh, analysis and simulation at various levels. The, the buildings, the linkage geographically, the time series analysis uh, epidemiologically is quite uh, sophisticated, and then interaction, you're testing the time series interaction with temperature. And uh, so colleagues uh, here generated these, these uh, area markers of where people are uh, overheating. It turns out, for reasons I don't fully understand yet, that the, the, temp the parameter that seems most important in determining the relationship with, uh, between outdoor temperature and mortality is daytime bedroom temperature. Why daytime and bedroom, I don't know. Daytime uh, living room temperature or nighttime bedroom temperature, I could understand, but I'm not quite sure, but that's what it says. And what do we find? Well, we find that there is evidence that if you are in a, in a dwelling which is more likely to go overheat, that relationship does indeed get steeper. And we, are, we know roughly how much steeper it gets. The general relationship, the average, is about a 3% increase for each degree Celsius warmer it gets there's about a 3% increase in mortality. But if you live in a, uh, uh, but that 3% increases another 1% for each degree warmer your house is compared to the average. So if the temperature anomaly, if the average temperature in a home is let's say 25 Celsius and your home is of degree warmer, it increases that slope by about 1.3%. Uh, so it goes up from a 3% increase to a 1.3, to a 4.3% increase with outdoor temperature. Doesn't sound much, but that is for each degree of anomaly, and that actually represents quite a substantial increase overall in the risk of dying from heat. Now that is one of the most tractable problems of all, believe it or not, in housing, is the how to link epidemiology to housing characteristics. And it's most tractable because, firstly, we're studying something which is easy, death, we can count that very easily. And there are many of them, about 650,000 across the country each year. Uh, we've got data to link, uh, been routing data at postcode level to housing characteristics. And the guys here have been able to develop all of these parameters that tell you what a house looks like. Now that similar approach, in theory, is what you need to apply to all measures where you're trying to work out or trying to attribute things um, to the dwelling. Um, just to finish this bit about the heat, it turns out that the evidence that hot homes uh, are more dangerous for you for heat is, is greater for very hot days than for hot days, which is perhaps unsurprising. 
Um, it's stronger for bedroom than for living room temperature. Not sure I understand that. And it's stronger for, I should say, nighttime rather than daytime. So that's the wrong way around. Nighttime rather than daytime. Um, but given all of the different uh, approximations and all of that linkage process, you know, the simulations can only be done for a kind of idealized house. The linkage at geographical level isn't done precisely one to one, it's done for typical characteristics and, and something that we have at postcode level. Uh, the linkage to mortality is sort of precise at one level, but the way you get the attribution is based on another level of analysis. Given all that, it seems quite extraordinary that we can see these signals, but that's the sort of extent you have to go to, to see signals, and I think this is quite persuasive evidence, um, which kind of fits with where you want to go. Um, now, I'll come back to some of those epidemiological analyses in a minute, but just to end this bit is that once you've got evidence about how certain characteristics affect health, then the obvious thing is to say, well, right, can we <coughs> assess certain policy options? Which is where you go, it divides directly into methods of modeling. And uh, I think one of, the, uh, one of the, the fruits of the collaboration we've had between here and the Mike's group over the last few years is to, to develop a model largely led by Ian Hamilton about uh, how to quantify the impact of changing the, characteristics, the energy efficiency characteristics of a dwelling what can you tell about the indoor environment? And uh, I don't go through this in detail, but it's based on the English Housing Survey, and from that, by again, through modeling, we can work out the baseline exposures and exposure changes associated with uh, interventions. And then, with those exposure changes, we can calculate health impacts because we know exposure response functions, and sometimes we may attribute monetary values to those impacts. And actually, I think it led to all sorts of uh, useful insights. Here is a simple one, um, which is one of the first things we try to sort of, it's almost a test case because it's a pure, a relatively pure problem, and that is, well, what happens to radon? Most people don't even consider radon, um, but it's fairly prevalent uh, gas. Uh, radioactive seeps into the dwelling from uh, the radioactive uh, uh, decay materials in the, in the soil and in the rocks. Um, it causes lung cancer, may also contribute to skin cancer. Um, and if you're exposed to it, we know the health risks associated with it very well, actually. Um, it's well-defined, uh, radiological epidemiology is quite well established, quite precisely known functions. This is what we think happens, that if you change the energy, if you went through the whole of the UK housing stock and upgraded it to be uh, in line with uh, the uh, energy efficiency targets we're trying to set, and that includes tightening in some degree, whether intentional or not, but tightening up the, the air exchange, you almost inevitably increase the exposures to radon inside the home. And without remediation, without prevention, about 5% of homes would have um, a concentration inside the home of about 200 becquerels per cubic meter. What does that mean? Well, that carries a 3% lifetime risk of lung cancer due to radon, not to cigarettes, to radon. And the second biggest killer for lung from lung cancer after cigarette smoking, it's about seven or eight percent of the of the total burden. We could be almost doubling that. Um, here are some of the uh, assessments of this is the, some scenario. You know, inevitably uh, variations in uh, assumptions about the uh, uh, ventilation rate. But here's the average baseline, about 21, and going up to 33 if you just increase the air types of the dwelling. Now, of course, you can, you can compensate and so on. But if you don't do that, this is what happens to uh, lung cancer instance. So this is, the, this is year zero when you make the change. This is 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later. It takes 10 years to develop lung cancer. But if you have the exposure, 10 years later, you expect there's going to be a rise in lung cancers. And you can see up it goes, and then they kind of settle down to their uh, rate after years. Interestingly, these go up, and then they don't go lower. Why? Well, this is deaths in the older ages, and the reason it goes down is because people are dying at younger ages, and they're not able to die at older ages. <laughs> uh, so the pattern shows you uh, where we go. Uh, I think I'll skip that one. I'm going to skip that one too. Let me then turn to the, the next graphic. So this is how you try to characterize a problem about the sort of the big exposures, radon, temperature, particles, whatever those kind of hazards are inside the head. Let's think about space. Now, I think space is very important, and uh, as many of you know, I, uh, 
the UK has pretty low average floor area among its new build dwellings. Um, I'm quite shocked how low it is, and I've always thought that we don't have don't build our homes big enough. Um, and this was a, a headline from the Telegraph of uh, last year. British homes are the smallest in Europe. Um, and I don't know precisely the cause data, but I looked at some data, and this is uh, some data I found that was published by, uh, <coughs> actually, I think it's an organization trying to su suggest how we can uh, shrink our contribution to uh, climate change. Um, and they're looking at how, how big the floor area. So here's the UK. We beat China, Russia, and Hong Kong, but nobody else. Uh, and we are less than half of uh, USA and Australia. Uh, way down here, and all these other countries are way above us. Uh, Italy, Sweden, Japan, Spain, Germany, you can read the list for yourself. Um, we're very small. Now, why is that a problem? Uh, well, I think it's a problem for all sorts of reasons. And indeed, various documents, including I think Reba, have produced reports sort of making the case for larger homes. Um, in the past, we've focused a lot on this notion of overcrowding. And I think that really dates back to the 1930s when people were worried about rheumatic fever, TB, and things like that, and you know, large families crowding the homes. But they don't really have a good definition of what it means today. It's obviously important also for privacy, which we should not underestimate uh, how important privacy is for most of us to, to run our lives, you know, if we need to, to study, to work, to relax, all those things we need for private space. Uh, it's important for f function and activities within the home, including, I add to this list, storage, because important to most of us are the sort of sentimental values of keeping things which we have and not having to chuck them out. If you don't have any space, there is no <coughs> room to store things. It matters also for air quality. If you've got a very small room, you can easily breach uh, levels of moisture or uh, particle concentrations. If you've got a much larger room, it takes much much more input before you start to uh, exceed uh, unhelpful, unhealthy levels. And it's important for mental well-being. You need kind of not to be on top of each other. Now, all of those things are kind of hard to, hard to measure, or at least measure a lot of them. Um, one of the things I just make about uh, overcrowding is that I think this is still quite a big issue for us, and we need to think about what it means. The definition, as far as I know, has no clear basis in evidence. It's uh, its health justification in the past has been focused on infectious risk in part, partly accidents and partly privacy, but there is no clear function of what it is to be overcrowded. And there's a sort of, you know, we have these definitions of more than one person in the bedroom, like that. Um, and there has been in the past overlap with, with dwellings in multiple occupation and in temporary accommodation, which is a different question. That's not overcrowding. So we don't really have the evidence base for most of these. Um, and of course, people say, well, actually, you know, of course, we should all be trying to live in smaller homes because they're more energy efficient. Um, and this is what the uh, those websites show, that if you go through the floor area, um, clearly you have gas consumption here, electricity consumption there. It's much higher. If you have a big home, you just use more. We all know that. Rich people, bigger homes, they consume more. And it doesn't matter whether you do it within a country, between countries, it's always the same. You spend what you've got. Uh, and it goes down, of course, in here, this is sort of the, the all average dwellings and the smaller ones down here consume less. So that's a smaller global footprint. But I think that's a really poor reason for saying we should be trying to make our homes smaller. Because, I mean, is that what the implication is? That we should really try to live in very small homes because that's all we deserve to have? Um, I think, on the contrary, that we ought to be having much bigger homes. Um, and this just goes to show as well also that uh, this is by age of dwelling against area. So of course there was a gradient downwards. Um, uh, interestingly, pre-1919 is not actually the worst. The worst is uh, 1919 to 1944. Uh, but there is a, a, a gradient downwards within each of these size categories. So it's not just about size, of course. It's about age and so on. But it's also connected with wealth. Um, so how big is big enough? <coughs> how much space do you need? How much space would you like? Um, well, it's not easy to answer, really. Uh, all I can say is, I think this question of, of how much space and how you use it is actually a crucial question for research, to say, what should we be suggesting, recommending? And I, <coughs> if nothing else, I would very much like to turn around this trend of trying to make dwellings smaller and smaller. I think it's a bad trend for all sorts of reasons. 
Now, of course, there has to be an optimal balance of some kind, and for more space, you want it for privacy and for air quality and moisture control, for mental well-being, and for full potential so people can function. But less space and volume because of cost, energy and resource use, land use, the global environment. And somewhere, we've got to find a <coughs> balance. Um, all of those, it seems to me, have uh, need some further research. But I'm not going to tell you how it's done, because I am not sure. And secondly, that would be another whole lecture in itself. Let me turn to another category, light, outlook, the local environment. So when we think about light, um, Actually, I was astonished a few years ago because I, I run the uh, sustainability group for my college and I'm trying to work out how we can be more energy efficient and so on. Turns out it's very difficult because whatever you try to do, everyone objects to. Um, but I asked a simple question about, you know, can't we turn off lights? And the thing I discovered was the only thing that governs the lighting in rooms was uh, a matter of, of plain illumination. That is, do you have the right um, lumens or whatever it is uh, to, uh, for your desk area? Uh, I hate overhead fluorescent lights, so I turn them off. Um, I wasn't allowed to turn them off. In fact, my office has no switch. So I've had to go and get uh, a special device that means I can remotely turn it off. It's now permanently disabled, so I have no overhead light. So I'm now technically in breach because I have no light in my room. What I've got are desk lamps, which is much more atmospheric, much more soothing, much more uh, focused on the tasks, task lighting and so on. It's much better. Uh, and actually, it's a very small, uh, very low wattage as well. So. Actually, I'm better for the environment, better for my own mental well-being, better for all sorts of things, but it's against regulation. Um, the character of that lighting seems important. The frequency range, you know, does it look a bit like sunlight, doesn't it? Uh, is it blue light, red light? Contrasts, you know, we all think about why are we interested in architectural lighting? Because it's interesting, because it makes our life more interesting. And there is meaning to it, but we don't measure any of that. And it's also about what you see. So it's not just what's, you know, how much light there is, but you know, can you look out? I had, a, I had a, an office in the London School for a long time. It was on the top floor. We think, great, you have a great view, except for there was a big parapet wall outside. So I looked straight out onto the back of a parapet wall. And uh, uh, I used to get really depressed by it. And it's kind of, I had a similar experience at home. So as some of you know, uh, a couple of years ago, we, uh, we had some building work done in my home. <laughs> because a, a, it was an old home, quite small, we needed to increase space. Um, but one of the things that really troubled me is that there was no way of looking into the garden. And this is, uh, you can't see it probably, this is the view from my office as it used to be. That's um, <laughs> the blank wall. That's all there was. Sunday morning I went into my office because I was trying to prepare various things, and this is the view from my office now. You can't see it very well, but that's different. Now I sat there and I thought, that's more tranquil. There's something about that which is much nicer than looking at the back end of a bus or worse. Now, how exactly it's better is hard for us to determine. You know, I mean, how that really translates in my mental well-being or something, I don't know. Maybe it doesn't have any bearing at all in a kind of objective sense, but it certainly feels different. Um, and people, there is now quite a discourse about green space. Um, and how we kind of, what we should try and do. I mean, the claims are that we should try to have more green space around us. And I don't quite know what that means, because actually there are very few places in the world where we're actually trying to put green space in. We're usually trying to plow it up and put, build houses. And in cities, of course, there's very little opportunity for that. But it's there because we think about mental health effect, tranquility, and promotion of physical activity. Well, what is it that we really see? Now, Actually, there are all sorts of parameters with green space, one of which is noise. Um, this is a map of uh, London, and you can sort of see this is a noise map. You definitely produce uh, noise from roads, and so you know, if you live along these corridors, you get quite a lot of noise. And if you live very close to it, I don't know if you can see that, but I might have the uh, houses along there, you're probably going to get quite a lot of noise. And that will be, we know that that is not very good for us in some sense because we're prepared to pay much less for the houses that are, that are there as opposed to ones which are offset from the road in an area like that, which is, way, which is back offset. Um, so we are even prepared to put a monetary value on how much we like the fact that we are no longer exposed to the immediate din of, uh, of road traffic. Um, but we don't really measure uh, what the impact on health is. There are an increasing number of uh, studies which are showing effects. 
Here is one, actually it came from the sister project to one that we're doing. Um, it's a study in London of road traffic noise. And essentially they analyzed the patterns of noise across London and found that if you live in an area where the uh, mean uh, number of decibels is greater than 60, uh, by compar comparison with less than 65, 55 decibels, then your hospital admission for stroke goes up by not much, that represents a 5% increase or a 9% decrease in the elderly, and all cause mortality rises by 4%. These are fairly subtle, but these are averages across all of London. So there is beginning to be evidence that uh, even something like noise is a problem. Um, but how do we measure what it is we want? Because these are all multi-dimensional problems. We're interested in mental well-being, perhaps. Um, so the traditional way of doing that is by questionnaire. Uh, but that's difficult because it means you've got to give a questionnaire, you've got to fill it in, and you know, these are not things you can do routinely easily. You can measure our physiological parameters, pulse rate, blood pressure, things like uh, sweating, skin contact, activity, and so on. You can even measure electroencephalography by putting those caps on people and getting them to walk around or measuring their brain waves all the time. You can have biochemical measurements, or you can measure the health events. But for these soft dragons, it's very difficult. You know, for well-being, you can't really have a health event. So all of these are problematic. Um, now the first question is, you know, is it really a question of green space anyway? Well actually, here is a systematic review, very recently published, uh, this year, 2015, um, looking at all the studies that have tried to look between residential uh, greens and blue space, that's water, uh, against mental well-being, um, and found only limited evidence for any causal relationship between surrounding greens <coughs> and mental health in adults. Uh, I won't read the rest of it. Essentially, the answer is jury is still out, no clear evidence. And um, I'm not altogether surprised. And part of the question is, well, is it actually greenness that matters? Or is it the fact that there's something interesting that you can kind of see outside? And uh, I don't know, I picked anywhere. Uh, I, I had a PhD student who got married in Siena, I went to his wedding. And I stayed not in exactly where this camera is, but not very far from it. And yeah, you look out and you think, this is kind of present. It's a very urban environment. There's no greenness. You can see it in the, in the hills in the background, but here it's not. But it is incredibly interesting and exciting, and it can kind of open the window and you think, ah, it's good to be alive. Mm -hmm. uh, not sure why, but it is. Um, I'm going to skip that one, sorry. And interestingly as well, people say, well, of course, if you have green space, you get to, uh, uh, you do, you're much more physically active. Well, actually, that's not really true. Um, here is an example. Uh, if you look at um, uh, the top thing here, this is a study which is a survey based of where people are physically active um, and trying to relate it to a whole category of things. Here is urban, town fringe, rural. And this represents the increase in the number of minutes of moderately vigorous physical activity you do per day. And in fact, as you go to <coughs> rural areas, it goes down. It's the lowest in rural areas, next on time fringe, and it's highest in urban areas. And I think there's a very real reason for it. And interestingly, green space uh, correlates almost not at all. Um, and I'll skip that one as well. This one is, uh, demonstrates how it is that most people get their physical activity. It's all about the destination where they're going to. So they get in the car, and I've forgotten where you start from here, I think. And they, in the red, they're a passenger, essentially, in a car or a vehicle. They go somewhere, then they get out, then they walk around, and sometimes they're a bit more active than that, and then they get back in the car, and so on. The, the thing that determines their activity are just destinations. And it's going to do things like shopping or going to the bank, sometimes with a bit of recreation, but it's almost never doing the sort of thing that we normally think about, specifically like going to a gym or going to play football. For 99% of the population, it's not that at all. It's just simply going to destinations. And if you live in an urban area, those are much easier to, to get to. Um, actually, I'm going to skip these because you can't even read the... Uh, can you read those? Well, okay. Um, this is, this is uh, trying to look at sort of well, how do different cities compare. Uh, Tend to travel to work um, uh, by cycling, in this case. Try to make a case, well, what's the, are some cities better than others about their, their design? And if you look at, kind of, this is the predicted regression line, as it were, the sort of where the expectation is. You can see here there are certain cities which we all well know about. They include, you can read them, Amsterdam, Stockholm, Copenhagen. They're the good cities. We all cycle there. 
Uh, and UK, we're down there. So we're below where we should be. So we're doing badly. <coughs> um, except, if you uh, look at it about walking and cycling, not just cycling, ooh, do you see where London is? London's there, Copenhagen's there. The pattern has suddenly shifted. And so it depends on how, what you <coughs> count. And one of the questions is, you know, what is it you're really trying to measure uh, with any of, these, uh, any of these kind of surveys of activity, and how can you make an attribution against uh, this phrase? Mm -hmm. May you take a while to advance. Thinking about it. You want to get exactly 40 minutes for so. Okay, uh, all right, I'm going to skip on. Because uh, I'm kind of coming to the end anyway. When I think I will actually just skip to the end because essentially um, there are various characters about the sort of the urban structure in total. But I want to make one last point before I conclude, which is this. And uh, I didn't quite know what to put in here, but there is also something that indefinable something that kind of makes me excited to live in London or to go to Siena or to be any places. And if London was just rows and rows of houses all built to very high standards and all protecting against hazards, I would be bored to death. Mm. And it is vital to me. People sort of say, oh, this is extravagant that we got these fancy buildings on. To me, they are vital. And I don't know, this is the Shard. I have never been to the Shard, mm -hmm. uh, but I can see it on my cycle route in in the morning. It's a nice road. He just stands up and I think, oh, that's exciting. And uh, you can see photos of it. You can go there. And, okay, it's likely to be the rich people who go there often, but it is so exciting. And London is full of these exciting buildings, and that makes a difference. And we ignore it. You know, there's no air quality measurement here, but this is tremendous contribution to the sort of cultural interest of living in a city, I think. Now, okay, it's a bit of a hodgepodge of things that I've covered. <laughs> But it does seem to me that there are all sorts of aspects of the way we build buildings and our dwellings and the environments in which they live, which we fail to capture. We're getting good at doing all of these kind of hazard ones, but not all of these other aspects, not all the exciting things. So we need a broader research agenda. We need, of course, to develop epidemiological methods so we can capture better some of these things about using space and attribution and so on. And I think that, uh, for me, you could easily make a case for a program I've worked on really looking at the space question, what is it we should be trying to achieve? Local environment, the impact of design, all of those are important. And of course, we shouldn't forget about real life operation and how things do and do not get done, because that's important. But it's the principles here, and this is a much broader research agenda than we tend to focus on. And that's my main point, really. Let's try and think a bit broader about what it is we really want to know about the place we live in, because they are much more exciting and interesting and varied than we tend to think about when we reduce them down to a box with their quality levels. That's it. Thank you very much, Paul, and that's my address if you want to get to it. Thank you very much, Paul, for an excellent and very stimulating uh, talk. So we, we've got some time now for some, uh, for some questions and uh, discussion before we adjourn for some drinks. So uh, I'll hand it over to the floor for, uh, for any, any questions to Paul. There's one, this might be a silly question. Um, is there a, a building standard that takes into account all the well-being aspects rather than you know, energy efficiency or anything like that? Not quite, no, well, I'm not really. Is there anything like that? No, there's nothing you know, to do with uh, energy and uh, air quality, but uh, I'm, not, I'm certainly not aware of one that uh, deals with uh, well, there was, there was a <coughs> recently launched in the States called the World Standard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's the in, the, in, the, yeah, in the UK, I don't know. I think it's just one, yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, one comment I, I had, um, uh, thank you very much for a very, very interesting presentation, is that a lot of the parameters you were looking at actually very strongly vary with wealth. Yes, yes. Um, and that, that, and that, that particularly comes out with, you know, I, the mode of transport you take, yeah. um, the, the death risk, whether your house is going to overheat or underheat, yeah. are very strongly correlated with wealth. So, um, in, in, you know, so what is 
how do you unravel it? Isn't there a strong covariance? Well, I, I, absolutely. I mean, and that is, I mean, it was one of my four problems, I think, is the confounding. That's what I mean by it. You know, so that you aren't sure if you compare two houses. Is it because one house is better than the other, or is it because the people living in a better house are richer and have more resources and you know, better access to healthcare and all those things? Um, and I remember many years ago, we were involved in, uh, some of you may know, hate the, uh, uh, the can't even say it myself now, the Home Health and Safety Rating System. Um, but they had, we had to get some statistics for that. And I remember the very first question was, how do you decide what is attributable to the home as opposed to some measure of deprivation or something else? And it's very difficult. That's why, when you do comparisons, you have to be able to do them in a way where either you can remove the effect of wealth, or you can measure it and control for it, um, which amounts to the same thing, I suppose. Uh, but it's a, it's a big problem, because they're very many things are correlated. And uh, I didn't go through, but in relation even to outdoor air pollution, it's a problem. Because if you live close to the main road, not only do you have more noise, you'll have more air pollution, and you'll be poorer. And trying to separate those three is not easy. Um, now, it's not it turns out that there are subtle patterns, actually, when some very high polluted areas are also quite wealthy, like Mayfair, right in the centre of London, that's quite highly polluted. But you tend not to see people living right on the main road. And is that right on the main road which is the problem and how you separate? So that is an issue. Um, I, we push the limits of epidemiology in most of this, even where we've got things which we can count, because uh, there is confounding. I'm not really sure how to make an attribution of the house. There is the numbers game, we need much, many large numbers to be able to get any signal of that. And if we have soft outcomes, it's really problematic. So these are challenges, but, I mean, my experience has been over the last few years, that beginning to chip away at things and do things in ways which you can begin to get signals. But it's, it is innovative epidemiology. You're having to use things from different disciplines to contribute ways with markers and things you can use and analyze them in certain ways that minimize those sorts of bias. But it is a problem, and that's Always, and it's, it's one of the things what we, we're never really sure about the, the uh, relationship between mould and respiratory illness, because mouldy homes tend to be poorer homes. Uh, well, some rich homes too, but more poor homes. And that's a problem. Is the respiratory illness a function of, of their poverty, or is it a function of the fact that there's mould growing on the wall? And you can eventually chip away at this and work it out, but it's not simple. First of all, thank you for your amazing presentation. Uh, I remember a question you made, which said that uh, how big should the house be thought they are too big? Yeah. And I don't remember finding an answer about that. No, well, well, my answer was, and it seems to me <coughs> that is something where we need to start studying it. Because, um, I mean, I, I have a kind of an ulterior motive here, I, I'm not, uh, I'm not, uh, my own objectives here, which is that I think we are building houses which are too small. Now, of course, they're not too small to live in, but they are too small, in my view, to give optimal uh, function for people, to, for them to fulfill their own potential in the maximum so they can study properly, so they can have all that separation and tranquility and privacy that they need, um, and also to minimize risk. You know, all these problems about moisture and air quality and so on would be so much smaller if you had bigger rooms. It doesn't take it away, but as someone said, the solution to pollution is dilution. You know, if you make space bigger, it does a lot to some of those problems. Now, there is that, the way to answer it is, firstly, to try to quantify the different impacts of what, what we value and what we need to get out of space. And then you can do that optimization that I spoke about, which is there are things which, on the one hand, force us to have smaller dwellings, if you're worried about our global footprint, uh, land, space, and all that sort of stuff, you need to make the dwelling smaller. But on the other side, all those things we'd like to increase in value, which means we should make bigger ones. I would like to see some sort of calculation, some analysis of what it is we put in there. But that is a res quite a major research task. Thank you. Just in terms of the relationship with space, is there some of the findings with commercial side of the uh, <laughs> That's more complicated. I, I really, I mean, I, I'm not very well able to answer it because actually I think there's much less research on commercial space. Um, that's not true in all areas. I mean, the, there are two big areas of both where there is studies on commercial space. One of which is to do with uh, um, the overall air quality. I mean, people used to be interested in the sick building syndrome with you know, commercial space with sort of um, uh, badly maintained air conditioning systems and so on. Um, and, 
There's also sort of uh, evidence on the way people use space. Um, there have been studies of kind of people getting better in hospitals, you know, if you kind of make, not, not the space itself, but, you know, give them a view outside and so on, but <coughs> they take some interpretation. I'm not sure exactly how strong I would view the evidence from them, but they kind of suggest that if you give people the right sort of environment, it makes it easier to have a faster journey to recovery. Um, there probably is something for commercial, but it's, commercial space is different for all sorts of reasons, one of which is that the people who inhabit it tend to be quite young and fit, they're the working population. The people who are more vulnerable to uh, uh, illness are the, the very young and the old, and they spend nearly all their time at home rather than in commercial buildings. But there are questions there too, but that's, that's not a lecture, that's for next year for somebody to do. Okay, yeah, I don't know who's first, please. I have two questions. Um, one is concrete, uh, concerns the confounding. Yes. Um, it probably also depends very much on how old the people are who live in some region. Do you account for that? Yeah, oh, well, yes, I mean, uh, age and sex are the things you can account for fairly easily because if you do studies, um, because we're trying to, to link health data to housing data, you tend to use routine data sets. But the things which are always recorded, you always know the age of, nearly always, you know, 99% of people have an age recorded and it's usually accurate. And you usually know their sex. So those things aren't so difficult. And you can, based on their place of residence, get a, a measure at a small, fairly small area level of socioeconomic deprivation, but probably not sufficient to get that subtle distinction of living on a road as opposed to off a road. Um, but age and sex, yes, they're always there, and you, you know, in any central model would stratify by or use regression methods to remove those effects. So those aren't the ones we worry about. It's the subtle, it's the subtler self-selection, the poverty uh, type of questions which are much more problematic to disentangle. One, two. The second is what I, I really like the board and the systems perspective. How do you go about knowing what to include and what to exclude in such a perspective? We come to you and ask you to do a system dynamics <laughs> process. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult question. I, mean, I think all of these, I mean, basically, this was me putting down some thoughts on a page. You know, I sat down, I thought, what am I going to say? So here are some of the things. But, you know, the thing to do is actually to ask people about what matters and so on. And the one, one of the big things I've really glossed over, of course, you know, the cost issue is so important. I mean, it, it almost makes all the other health considerations pale, because if you can't afford anywhere, you know, what can you do? And uh, affordability of houses is quite a big issue at the moment. But beyond that, clearly, there are important issues about what I'm really trying to influence is the fundamental design the way we go about building and developing buildings. And uh, man, I think we're not very good at it. So I'm going to have a question. Yeah, so it's just like it's interesting with the emphasis on houses yes. and the size of the houses. Yet not all people live in houses; there are people who live in flats. And your graph, uh, how uh, uh, yes. which houses are the smallest compared to many other um, Western European countries? On top of that, living in the flats in those countries is again much higher percentage than living in England. So, are there any studies done in the flats alone? Uh, okay, well, I should or, I, I, I should it's, confess. It's a very important issue. Uh, Firstly, that, um, that my, saying a house is my shorthand, I just mean a dwelling. It's just yeah, easy to say house and dwelling. So in this, in nearly everything I said, we include flats as part of the spectrum. Um, and in fact, actually, uh, if I'm wrong, we actually have quite a high percentage of, of houses as opposed to flats, don't we? Compared to a lot of other European countries. So I think actually, um, uh, well, you, know, you can do it how that, how, how, uh, how, how you like. But, uh, I'm concerned with dwellings in general, and it's, it's, I, I don't make any distinction really of saying, you know, you must have a, a house with a garden and so on as opposed to being flat. Flats are very nice too, they can also be problematic. All of them we need to look at function, design, how we use it, and not just of, is the air quality good enough? But, you know, is it somewhere that you're going to want to wake up in the morning, live in that space, and say, yeah, this is great, and, you know, yeah. Those, those matter. But the relationship between environmental footprint, obviously, it's very different. It so is. If you put them together, like dwellings as such, that yes. is a house it, or whether it's it, it a, is. I mean, and there is a unit in a in a park. There is a tension here. I mean, I, I told you that um, I uh, we had some building put down, and my view from my office changed. Um, but I was really irritated during the planning process. We had to get, get our things approved, and we wanted to put in big windows so you could see all of that great space. But we had to fight tooth and nail to get big windows put in because they said, well, it's not very environmentally friendly, is it? Because you use too much heat out of that window. 
And I thought, that is just such a distorted way that it's using one parameter only and saying, you've got to have a small window because that's the way we can better contain the thermal properties of your dwelling, as opposed to all of that outlook and things that can influence uh, positively the, the environment of people inside. Um, so we kind of got things a bit too focused on the hazard problem or indeed our global priorities, I suppose. Any time for one last, uh, one last question? Go for it. Uh, right, houses are already quite expensive. Would yes. making them bigger cause more problems than actually making, like, having smaller houses because people can't get on the property? Like well, um, you are correct to a degree, but, and I'm, but I'm not a finance expert on them, knowing how this works. But it does, I mean, I sound like Jerry Gordon <coughs> probably, it does not have to be that way. <laughs> My understanding is partly it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a funny game about the way house prices are, are governed. Um, and it is, uh, you know, it's, it's supply and demand and various things chasing it. But it's not like that in other countries. Even with countries which have got densities similar to ours, do not necessarily have the same problem with house prices. There are ways of fixing it, but that is for somebody else to talk about. Um, probably Neil May would like to talk about that, I think. Um, I agree, but it is not inevitable because partly it's that way because we put so much, we invest so much in our land values. But if we had control over rents, if we had more on the, you know, the value of the property was in the, the bill as opposed to the space it occupies, then it would be very different. And part of it is, I think, because of the way developers, who are not constrained in any way, can maximise profits. If you can put three flats on a space instead of two, you get more profit. And that's the simple arithmetic of it, I think. Let's continue the discussion. So join me again in thanking Paul for...